good afternoon, everyone. We'd like to welcome you once again to another Bible study. We're thankful to the Lord for keeping us safe from harm and danger during this past week with all of its ups and downs. And here we are in his sanctuary to study his word once more in a peaceable and friendly environment. We thank God for this. Um, these days would not last forever. We understand this. But we want to make the best of the opportunities whilst they still linger. Welcome on board. We'd like to say a welcome to our friends across the globe, our friends here locally, our friends on Northwest 19th Avenue, <coughs> our friends in Miramar, <laughs> our friends in the Caribbean, Caribbean countries, Haiti, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago and beyond, uh, Guyana. Welcome to our friends in Canada, our friends in Europe, in Australia, in India, South Africa and beyond. Welcome on board. Hope and pray that God would sustain you and your families during these turbulent days of Earth's history. <clears throat> um, this afternoon's Bible study is titled, Good Behavior Versus Conversion. <clears throat> As we study, um, you may have questions, you may have comments. Um, feel free to send them in to YouTube at omegatruthlive at gmail.com or on Facebook at Bromax777. We'll try to give you a scriptural answer. And we'd like to remind you that you can download any Bible study that we do here at Omega Truth for free from our website at omegatruth.org. <clears throat> so before we start, let's pray and invite God's presence. Oh, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for another day of life. Thank you for the services that were provided from morning until now. And Thank you for sustaining us all week by your grace, taking us to and fro upon the roads, watching over us, sending your holy angels to protect us. And here we are in your courts once more to serve and to learn at your feet. Pray that you would forgive us of the sins that we have committed all week and this day cleanse us from all unrighteousness and grant that as we study the topic this afternoon, good behavior versus conversion, Grant that we may take an introspect look at ourselves by your power to see where we have come up short. And we pray that you would heal and save us for your name's sake. Send us now your Holy Spirit with power and energy to sustain us. For we ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. Good behavior versus conversion. There's a huge difference between good behavior and conversion. The two should never be mixed up by those who are desiring of sanctification according to the will of God. A person can behave well by doing what is morally right. There, there's something called a moralist, right? A, a person who, who does what, what, you know, good stuff. So a person can behave well by doing what is morally right, by abiding by the laws of the land, by paying their taxes on time, and maintaining a good credit score, good behavior. They, they are good citizens who manifest courtesy. They, they manifest respect for others who may speak perfect English and are achievers uh, as they pursue their stellar careers in different lines. That's good. Uh, some others, they make meaningful contributions to society. Uh, some others, they, they never use foul language and they are looked up to by others as role models. Good, good behavior, right? That's, that's all well and good. There are very many Christians in our day who fall into these categories. And to all appearances, some are in good and regular standing according to what can be seen externally. Now, these qualities ought to be commended and encouraged because a good Christian should also be a good citizen who tries his best or her best to behave well and to stay out of trouble. That, that, that's a scriptural teaching. That's all, all well and good. <clears throat> Read from 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 5. Listen to what it says. David went out whithersoever, wheresoever Saul sent him, and he behaved himself well. He behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, he put him in charge of the army, and he was accepted in the sight of the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And David behaved himself wisely in all of his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. 
Now, you notice how many times the Bible says that David behaved himself well? It's right there in the scriptures. This is not the only passage that states that. There are several other passages in the Bible. I looked them up where the Bible states explicitly that David was a well-behaved person. Christians are encouraged in both the Old and New Testaments to behave ourselves in a becoming manner because we are a spectacle unto the world, unto angels, and unto men. And therefore, it is a sacred and moral duty for us to do our best to live as though we are representatives of God's kingdom. The Bible teaches us that. That's a scriptural teaching. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. You know, um, Paul is writing here concerning bishops and elders and deacons and uh, whoever, right? Might be serving in the church. A bishop then must be blameless. He, you know, he must behave himself well. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not, not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, well behaved. One that rules his own house well, right? Having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man knows not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Right? Good, good behavior. The, the, the Bible speaks about that, right? Now, Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 1. But speak thou those things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, the aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine. Be careful with that word, much, eh? <laughs> be, be very careful with that word, much. Not given to, to much wine. Teachers of good things, good behavior. The Bible teaches us that, all right? That they may teach the young, men, the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God should not be blasphemed. All of these passages of scripture, they speak of good behavior. However, true conversion goes much deeper than mere good behavior because the work that God desires to do in our hearts is to entirely uproot the old man with all of its luggage and baggage and then replace it with an entirely new heart and mind that is aligned with God so that the spirit of God may dwell on the throne of our hearts continually. The problem with persons behaving well without being converted is that they can flip in an instant when the right set of circumstances converge. Even though the Bible repeatedly states that David was a well-behaved person, there were times, times when other people would touch a raw nerve in David and a different individual would emerge from the shadows in those instances. Latent tendencies David probably was not aware of and the dormant characteristics would bubble up to the surface from time to time, which revealed his need of conversion. But between these uh, contrary ex exhibitions, whenever they occurred, David was generally known to be a well-behaved person. The word latent, that word, latent, it refers to something that is real and present, yet not generally visible for anyone to see. And this should concern us, because like David, we too may be inadvertently harboring latent tendencies that we may not be aware of until they bubble up to the surface and shock the daylights out of the one in question as well as onlookers. For instance, when Nabal refused to help out David with the food which he had requested, a switch that had lain dormant, right, was flipped on internally in David, and the composure of such a well-behaved person was reversed in an instant. It is usually the case 
that we may only realize we have dormant or latent evil tendencies when one treads on our proverbial toes. We read 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 9. David's young men came and they spoke to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased. <clears throat> See, David had protected Nabal's uh, flocks and his servants whilst they were in the wilderness for free, uh, you know, over a period of time. And so, yeah, Nabal, he's sharing sheep, you know, big time of rejoicing, they're gathering whatever it is, they're fruits or whatever it is. So David says, you know, he makes a reasonable request. He, say, he says, um, well, Nabal, you know, see if you could help out your brother here, you know. Give us a little food, you know, because we are hungry and we, we could use some groceries. So David's young men, they came, they spoke to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and they ceased. And Nabal answered, look, look at Nabal's answer. <clears throat> Nabal answered David's servants and said, who is, who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants. That word servant, right, in the passage is really referring to David as a slave. There be many servants nowadays that break away everyone from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my groceries and my flesh that I have killed for my sharers? Shall I take them and give them unto men whom I know not whence they be? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told those sayings to David. <clears throat> See there? Watch it now. This is a, a well-behaved person. <laughs> Under normal circumstances, when things are going good, he behaves himself well. This, this is David. The Bible just stated, we just read in several passages, David behaved himself well. This is the same person. David said unto his men, Good he own every man his sword. And they girded every man his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And they went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff that they had in the wilderness. And now David said, right? I wanted to follow his line of reasoning. Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow had in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto, un, unto him. What David is saying is that we, 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 we kind of wasted time protecting this guy's stuff, man. You know? We, we could have let the marauders and the bandits or whatever it is take advantage of them and take them out, but we protected them. But it seems like it was a waste of time, right? That, uh, that's how he is reasoning, so that nothing was missed of all that um, pertained unto them and he hath requited me evil for good. You see his line of reasoning? Well, what he's saying, he is not treating me in a commensurate manner to how I treated him. Now guess what? A converted person in a situation like that, right, would pray for Nabal and would seek to do Nabal good. That's what the Bible teaches, right, concerning a converted person, right? Jesus says in the New Testament, Ren render not evil for evil, but contrarywise, blessing. All right? In, in the New Testament, right? Uh, Paul, right? And so, what a converted person will do in a situation like that where they were ill-treated or they were not treated rightly, all right? They would not look to deal in the same currency that Nabal is dealing in. They, they would use the currency of heaven, right? Um, to, 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 to deal with a situation like that that could become volatile. And so more, all right? God do more to me also, right? Uh, unto the enemies of David, sorry. If I leave all that pertain unto Nabal by the morning light, any one that pisses against the wall. All right, so he was going to take out all the men. Uh, just for some context, here are some of the Psalms David himself wrote about dealing with others in situations such as these, right, that may not be favorable. We are observing those scriptures because when we put ourselves into David's shoes, we ourselves may also discover a disconnect between what we preach and what we actually do when others violate our rights or may tick us off for some reason. We read. Psalms 15, 
verse 1. This is the same David. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. But you know, verse 3. He that backbites not with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor. This is the same person. And so, these tendencies, right, of revenge, they lay dormant. That, that, that's, that's what we mean by the word latent. They lay dormant in David until the right set of circumstances converge. But as a general rule, David was a well-behaved person. Title of the Bible study for this afternoon is Good Behavior versus Conversion. Apparently, good behavior versus conversion was also an issue with the disciples of Jesus Christ. Because as a general rule of thumb, they would try to behave themselves well when Christ was around. But at times, when he was absent, different moods and attitudes would bubble up to the surface when the right set of circumstances would converge. Now, I'm, I'm sure you have heard this statement, right? Right? That, you know, we are in different stages of spiritual growth. And there's another maxim that is often touted by some Christians is that the Lord ain't finished with me yet. All right. <laughs> it is worthy of note that the disciples of Christ may not have been doing these or manifesting these attitudes deliberately. But it's just a fact of life that the presence of a superior can cause or motivate persons to behave well. Not long ago on my way to Orlando, Florida, I was going up to Orlando, Florida, right? Uh, persons were driving well over the speed limit at that section of the I-75 where state troopers would most likely not be present. But suddenly, all the driver, drivers seem to be slowing down and driving at the speed limit for no apparent reason. So I, I wanted to know uh, what was the reason for such good behavior all of a sudden on the part of so many drivers, including myself. It so happened <laughs> that in one lane, there was a trooper driving at the speed limit. And guess what? all of the other drivers immediately fell into line, even though some may not have been convicted in their heart and mind. Again, there's a huge difference between driving through a school zone, fuming and fussing because one is late for work, and another person driving at the same speed limit with the understanding that kids would be crossing at any given time. Even though the two types of drivers may adhere, they may be adhering to the rules of the road and may actually behave well. One does so from the heart, while the other does so because of the likely presence of cops with radar guns. It is too often the case with some Christians that we might display a Sabbath persona whilst during the week when there is no elder or pastor around a completely different person might emerge. In the case with the disciples of Jesus, a storm was brewing secretly over who should be appointed the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And from what the scriptures teach, it had caused a division among them as all of them strove to have the highest place next to Christ. You see, <clears throat> in the upper room, in the upper room, right when Jesus was having the Last Supper, you know who was closest to Christ? John. John was on one side, and on the other side of Jesus Christ was Judas. <laughs> Lo and behold, when Jesus was present and had asked them about the situation, they immediately put on their best behavior and they remained silent. The presence of Jesus Christ. Just remember what, I just, what we just said concerning the trooper. 
the presence of Jesus Christ, right, put a different perspective, a different spin on the matter. And Jesus could have addressed the behavioral aspect of his disciples' contention. But doing so would just be putting a temporary bandage on a problem which would rupture most likely at some future point. Very often in the Christian church, the focus is put on behaviors which are indeed symptoms of much deeper problems. And therefore, if persons focus too much on behavioral patterns, we would entirely miss the point because doing so is the equivalent of playing guacamole with behaviors. In other words, what is addressed presently in some outburst of latent tendency is the same as trying to fix this or that issue in one's character, whereas an entire change of heart would usually take care of the problem. For as we stated before in a previous Bible study, there are certain things a converted person just does not do. A truly converted person, a truly converted person never seeks for the highest place. <laughs> for such a person would gladly prefer, they, they, they would gladly prefer a lower position so that someone else could get the promotion in question if there happened to be any dispute over the matter. A, a truly converted person. In the plan of salvation. Right? Uh, furthermore, a converted person will genuinely be happy and merry for the person who got promoted. And the converted one will do all they can to make life easier for that person, not more miserable for the promoted person. It all has to do with good behavior versus true conversion. In the plan of salvation, God does not desire to deal merely with the symptoms of some underlying issue in our hearts. He instead seeks to perform an entire operation, a transformation that will fundamentally change who we are to the core. Because it's only by doing so that persons could be rendered safe for the kingdom of heaven. Where it is stated that sin would not arise a second time. We read. Mark chapter 9 verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Uh, the other disciples who were not made privy to the experience on the mountain were probably wondering and probably grumbling about why they were left out of the loop. Well, why take Peter, James, and John and leave us down here? What's going on? What, what, you're going to give them some inside information? <laughs> if inside information was going to be disclosed, why would Jesus leave them out? Right? And apparently only favor these three. Thus they reasoned until great darkness came over their minds because now they are making their personal grievances the main point of concern while the interests of the kingdom, the salvation of souls, have become subordinated. And therefore, when Jesus begins to address the issue, he is not going to deal as we often do with the periphery, with mixed up moods and attitudes. No. Jesus is going to go for the jugular, as it were. The issue of conversion, which, if and when accomplished in his, his disciples, will take care of not only the current issue, but any other problem that may or may not arise in the future. But if Jesus was only to address the behavioral aspects, the same issue would certainly flare up again. The same problem will come back under favorable or under trying circumstances, as the case might be. We read Mark chapter 9, verse 14. When he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them, right? The, the, the reason why the, the, the scribes were questioning with them is because a man had brought his son 
right? Who was demon possessed for the disciples to cast them out and they could not, right? Uh, the, the reason why they could not is because, right? Is because, uh, uh, listen carefully, they were seeking for the highest place. Contention was uh, amongst them. You see, you, you have often heard us say here on Omega True that God is a spirit, right? In, 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 order, in order for God to work effectively through us as his servants, you know, his instruments, you and I, right? The, the, the mind has to be right, you know. In, in order for his power to be made manifested, in, in, you know, it, it, our minds have to be in harmony with his. And so the disciples are coming out to do battle with Satan, and they have contention amongst themselves. They will find that they have no supernatural power because their minds are not right. Let's read. All right? He asked the scribes, why are you questioning with them? Questioning with them. One of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which has a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he takes him, he tears him, he foams, he gnashes with his teeth, he pines away. And I spoke to your disciples. I came to your disciples that they should cast him out. And they could not. We note well that the disagreement amongst the other disciples had hamstrung their efforts to cast out demons. That's because God is a spirit. And whenever or wherever our minds may be consumed with fussing and fighting over a plethora of non-essentials, Jesus' vital power to engage and conquer the hosts of darkness will be eerily absent in us. We read Mark chapter 9, verse 28. And <clears throat> when Jesus was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, this kind comes not, um, can come forth by nothing except by prayer and fasting. In the same chapter, verse 33, when he came to Capernaum and being in the house, he asked them, now he's going to address the problem directly. What was it that you, dispute, that you disputed among yourselves by the way? Right? But they held their peace and remained silent. They behaved well. Because by the way, as they were coming, they had disputed amongst themselves who should be the greatest in the kingdom. Matthew chapter 18, verse 2, line upon line, as the Bible says, it must be studied. Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. A very interesting um, commentary is written by the servant of the Lord in the book Desire of Ages on this same situation that had occurred between the disciples and Christ. Reading from the book Desire of Ages, pages 435 to 437, some excerpts uh, that would really help us to understand what was taking place. The Savior gathered his disciples about him and said to them, if any man desires to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. There was in these words a solemnity and impress impressiveness which the disciples were far from comprehending. They did not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom. And this ignorance, this misunderstanding, seemed to be the apparent cause of their contention. But the real cause lay deeper. By explaining the nature of the kingdom, Christ might for the time have quelled their strife. But this would not have touched the underlying cause. You see there? Even after they had received the fullest knowledge, any question of precedence amongst them might have renewed the trouble, and thus disaster would have been brought to the church after Christ's departure. The strife for the highest place was the outworking of that same spirit which was the beginning of the great controversy in the worlds above, and which had brought Christ down from heaven to die for us. Lucifer desired God's power, but not his character. He sought for himself the highest place, 
and every being who is actuated by his spirit will do the same. And thus, alienation, discord, and strife will be inevitable. Dominion becomes the prize of the strongest. The kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of force. See what is taking place in Ukraine? Watch. They're striving for the highest place. Watch. We're reading sacred things here, man. The kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of force. All right? Okay. The Ukrainians wouldn't buckle. Okay. We will bomb them until they buckle. Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of force. Every individual regards every other as an obstacle in the way of his or her own advancement or a stepping stone on which he himself may climb to a higher place. Very tenderly, yet with solemn emphasis, Jesus tried to correct the evil. He showed them what is the principle that bears sway in the kingdom of heaven and in what true greatness consists as estimated by the standard of the courts above. It was not enough for the disciples of Jesus to be instructed as to the nature of his kingdom. What they really needed was a change of heart that would bring them into harmony with its principles. In the third chapter of Revelation, the last day church, Laodicea, seems to suffer with the same problem of good behavior versus true conversion because the right things are being done. And for all intents and purposes, it may seem to the casual observer that the church is on a roll, on a roll to glory. But when the true witness, even Jesus Christ, drills down deeper, he discovers something very disturbing happening with many church members. Because like the disciples of old, some are behaving very well. Others have become contented with the status quo, and stagnation is taking a toll on growth because our good behaviors have usurped the place that true conversion should really have. We read Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. This is Jesus here, right? Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. The Laodicean church is the last church in Bible prophecy. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I preferred, I would that you were cold or hot. Why? Because you say that I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. In other words, you know, they are behaving well. Right? They don't need conversion. And no, it's not thou that you are wretched and miserable, poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see clearly. Some of us may now be wondering if these words that we just read might pertain to me and you personally, and rightly so. Why? Because the Lord is addressing not only the church as a corporate body, he is also speaking to you and me in the present tense and on an individual level. To answer our unspoken questions, there are some basic tendencies which if we see in ourselves should raise a red flag as far as the issue of behaviors versus conversion is concerned. For instance, if we know that we have the tendency to seek strict justice from those who may offend us, then it is time for us to go have a talk with God. If we feel good, when our enemies are punished for the wrongs they may have done to us, then it is time for us to go have a talk with God. The truly converted person takes delight in pardoning those who may trespass against us and thus seeks his or her restoration, reinstatement as quickly as possible. The tendency to rupture relationships with those who may despitefully use and persecute us 
is not in harmony with the mind or character of God because there are very, um, there are very many important passages of Scripture which show the mind of God in such situations. Let, let's read some of them. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 17. This is one of the passages of Scripture that I found it necessary to commit to memory. Listen to what it says. Rejoice not when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. <laughs> Lest the Lord see it, and it displeases him, and he turns away his wrath from it. You, you, you see, the, the, the disposition, right, to crave strict justice against those who have done us wrong, that disposition does not come from a converted heart. It does not. A converted person, right, would seek to do good to those who despitefully use and persecute us. You, you see? As Christians, the converted Christian does not fight fire with fire. Because if you do so, you will only get more fire. We have to use a different currency in dealing with persons who may have trespassed against us. And we are not speaking about doing so because you know what is the right thing to do. That's all well and good. You know what is the right thing to do? All right, go ahead and do it. But it goes deeper than that. You, you have to do it because that's who you are because of conversion. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is a God like unto you, who pardons iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retains not his anger forever because he delights. You see that word? Look at that word there. He delights in mercy. God, <laughs> you know, <laughs> let me show you something, brethren. You know, in, in, in some of us, you know, revenge makes us feel good. <laughs> Let me show you what the Bible says. What, what makes God feel good? Setting the sinner free. Pardoning him or her. That's what makes God feel good. You know, we're speaking in human terms. Right? Who is a God like unto thee? Right? He retains not his anger forever. Because he delights in showing mercy. Line up online. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. This is a chapter in the Bible that should be committed to memory. Do I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity? A, a well-spoken person. I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling, tinkling cymbal. All right? Uh, a person could be eloquent, right? Eloquence is not any evidence of conversion. That's what, that's what Paul is saying. Do I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge? W well informed, you have your doctorate. That is not any evidence of conversion, <laughs> according to the Bible. And though I, I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity. That, that word charity does not have to do with giving things to the poor. It has to do with the gold of love, which is the foundation of God's character. Right? If I have faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, have not love, I am nothing. Right? And though I bestow all my goods, and do I have the gift of prophecy? Right? All right, okay, we did that one already. Let's go to verse 3. Right? And do I bestow all my goods to feed the poor? This is charity as we know it. A person, you know, they do charitable work. Oprah Winfrey, you know, she has various um, schools in South Africa and whatever. She do, she's doing good stuff. <laughs> good stuff, right? Um, there are many charities, you know, in the Muslim world, in the Christian world, you know, Red Cross. Uh, good stuff. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, you become a martyr. And have not charity, have not the love of God in my heart, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. It wants not itself. It's, it's not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeks not her own interests. Is not easily provoked and thinks no evil. 
Charity bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. All right? And charity never fails. You, you, you see, it's a, it's a different attitude. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a change of heart. The only reason why charity, love, can never fail in a Christian is because it has become an integral part of a person's character through conversion. And therefore, if and when such a converted person is shaken inside up and upside down, nothing but love will bubble to the surface. Like the disciples in days of yore, there is hope for us in our day. But when we read the last verses of Revelation chapter 13, the Lord invites us to change. It's not merely the behavior that is too often touted, but a deep and enduring transformation that would convert us from the inside out. And so let us therefore not be discouraged by what we may see in ourselves from time to time. But let us rather seek the Lord whilst he may be found so that he can take us from one le level of spiritual growth to the next. For this is his good and perfect will for every one of us, even our conversion. And so we will end with two passages of scripture which would confirm this sacred truth concerning conversion. That's the work of salvation that God desires to do in our hearts. And we hope and pray that God's grace and mercy would enable and sustain us through the process. We read Revelation chapter 3 verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, I correct. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, if any woman hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and I am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an heir, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So our last passage is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even our sanctification, our conversion. We'll now open up the floor for any questions or concerns that you may have. We'd like to remind our friends online and here locally. All right? You're sending your questions on YouTube at omegatruthlife at gmail.com or on Facebook at Bromax 777 and we'll try to give you a scriptural answer by the grace of God. We like to answer everything from the scripture as much as we can by the grace of God. Okay. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, we have the microphones ready there, right? Just wait until we get the microphones ready. You see, um, <clears throat> in the training of our children, right? A lot of times as parents, we put heavy emphasis on the behavioral patterns, right? Let me show you something about, I will say, most of our kids. Uh, you know, they, they grew up in children. Mo most of them, really, they, they know what is the right thing to do. You know. <laughs> really and truly. They, they know what is the right thing to do. The, the, the issue is, is not really trying to get them to do the right thing as, as a behavior. You know, that, 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 that's one level, but that's not where it's at ultimately. What we are to pray for and what we are to seek God's face for on behalf of our children is that they be converted because conversion will take care of all of the other issues and problems that would bubble up from time to time. You see, um, as we stated in our Bible study previously, when Jesus was accosted, was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? 
Peter pulled out his sword. A self-defense, right? And he struck, you know, the high priest servant's ear, right? Uh, self-defense, right? But look, if you look in that, you look at that same situation with Jesus, right? Jesus allowed himself to be arrested. Peter couldn't deal with that at his level because he was not converted. And now he put back up his sword into his sheath, right, in, in obedience to what Jesus said. But he needed to be converted, right? And when you read the scriptures, Peter, after his conversion, never, ever once manifested that disposition to crave revenge. Not once. And so the, the issue is not a change of behavior, but a change of heart. You, you, you understand? That, that, that's what God is seeking to do in us. He, you know, he doesn't want us to behave well, do the right thing because he you knows it's the right thing. No, it's, it's much deeper than that. He wants to convert us and put his mind, his spirit, into our hearts and minds. And all of the other, you know, tendencies or whatever it is that might bubble up from time to time, they, they will be taken care of because we are converted. We are a different person. Yeah, um, one passage states in the Bible, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Right? All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There are things that a converted person just does not do. Period. All right, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. At what point mm -hmm. the disciples became converted? And what was the mechanism? And what was there? The mechanism. What, what, what converted them? <laughs> uh, that's a that, that's a tough question that you asked there. <laughs> At what point were they converted? Because obviously they were they were not converted. Um, uh, Jesus, he spoke to Peter, right? When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. That that was before the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter's conversion, right? Peter's conversion took place, right? After Gethsemane. Like when he, he, he was permitted to see who he really was. Because he said to Jesus, you know, I, I will never leave you. You know, I, there, there, there's no way. I, I'm not going to desert you under any circumstances. I'm just paraphrasing what he said. <clears throat> and Jesus said, um, all of you will be offended because of me this night. Peter re retorts. He said, I, I, though all men, he's referring to the other disciples, said, these guys here might desert you, but not me. I, I will not desert you under any circumstances. And so what, what Peter needed, like some of us need in our day, is a self-revelation of who he really was. Right? Of who he really was. What would you do? Let, let me show you something. Could we speak? Um, we are not here to query the conversion of anyone. That's not our domain, right? That's between God and the individual person. But I have to let you know that in many instances, right, if God were to permit Satan to tempt us, right, what we might say and do under pressure might shock ourselves. You heard what I said? Under pressure. You see, when things are going good, when things were going good, with the disciples, you know, they were healing and Jesus was preaching and everything was going hunky-dory, right? Those latent tendencies in Peter, they did not get opportunity to surface. But when the right set of circumstances converged, a different person emerged, right? And so, to answer the first part of your question, when did conversion take place? We know as from the experience of Peter, it was after he had that self-revelation. You see, it was not necessary for him to go through that grueling, embarrassing situation for him to know who he was. All he needed to do was to take Christ's assessment of him by faith and say, and say to himself, yes, Lord, you are correct. Even though I, I, I might not have reached there as yet, uh, I might not have exploded in that manner as yet, but I believe that you are God and that your assessment is correct. You see, if Peter had done that, all right, what happened is that he would have prayed. 
And let me tell you what, why he would have prayed. He would have prayed for grace, right? <laughs> so, so that he won't blow up in the faces of those who offended him, right? And God would have given him grace, right? Conversion might have taken place later, but he would have been saved that embarrassment, you know, when he cussed out the maid, you know, in public, you know, because, of, um, because he got offended. And so after, after cursing out the maid and whoever and whatever it is, the Bible says he went out and wept bitterly because he said, you know what? What Jesus was saying is really true. I mean, I, I can't believe I, 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 I can't believe I just cussed out, you know? <laughs> not, not only did I cuss out the maid in public <laughs> where, where everybody heard, but I denied that I know Jesus. I, I, I can't believe I really. <laughs> you, you, you understand? And so that, 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 that grueling experience brought him to his knees, as it were. It made Peter see who, who he really was. It made him see latent tendencies that were lying dormant in his character that he probably did not know of. Because when, when he, he swore to Jesus, I will not deny you under any circumstances. He meant what he said. But he did not know, right, that he had latent tendencies, dormant tendencies, evil tendencies within himself that needed to be addressed. And so after that experience, you know, he had his conversion. And um, you, we find that after Jesus was risen from the dead and he visited his disciples, he speaks to Peter, right? Peter, right? Do you love me more than these? Three times, right? And then he says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, right? From that point, you read in the scriptures, Peter never, not once, ever manifested that spirit of revenge, that, that craving for revenge, for strict justice, that he manifested before his conversion, not once, right? Um, let me show you in the scripture, right? Let me just show you in the scripture um, the, the before and after Peter. So, so you know, we, we like to verify everything from the scripture, right? Okay, give me um, Matthew. Matthew chapter 26. All right? Matthew chapter 26. Read them from verse 31. We'll wait for it to come up on the screen. Huh? Matthew chapter 26, coming up there. Then said Jesus, Jesus unto them, right? All of you shall be offended because of me this night. Because it is written in the scriptures, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Verse 33, I'll, I'll call out the verses, right? Peter responds, right? In verse 33, Peter answers and said unto him, Even though all men shall be offended, but uh, because of you, I will never be offended. Verse 34, Jesus replies to him, Peter, verily I say unto you that this night before the cock crows, you shall deny me three times. Verse 35, Peter retorts. He is not accepting Jesus' assessment of who he really is. And that's the problem there. You see, in, in Revelation chapter 3, as the Lord, the true witness, Jesus Christ, is assessing Laodicea. Even though we might not see certain things in ourselves, we have to take his assessment personally because he sees things that we do not see. Peter said unto him, verse 35, Though I should die with you, I am not going to deny you. 
likewise also said all the disciples. So none of them were converted. Right? Let's go down in the same chapter. Verse 48. Right? Verse 48 of the same chapter. Now he that betrayed him, uh, that's Judas, gave them a sign saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he hold him fast. Forthwith, verse 49. He came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, see how Jesus responds? This is a backstabber, right? Judas is a backstabber, right? He, he, he's a traitor. He, he's a spy, all right? And now he is selling out the Lord of glory to his enemies. Look at Jesus' response, right? Friend. That's what I'm telling you, you know, I, as I was doing the Bible study, you know, I, you know, I, I shot myself in my foot, <laughs> right? Jesus said unto him, friend, wherefore are you come? They then came there and they laid hands on Jesus and took him. Verse 51, behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Self-defense. Said, you know, I ain't going down without a fight. <laughs> then said Jesus unto him, right? This is in harmony with God's character. Put up again your sword into his place. Do not fight fire with fire because you're only going to get more fire. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. All right? Same chapter. <clears throat> verse 67. We'll read from verse 67 to 75 so we get context. Watch. Satan is turning up the, 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 the fire, right? He's turning up the furnace several notches now, right? And, and that's why I stated in Bible study, if God were to permit Satan to tempt us, a different you and me, could emerge of which we, we probably know nothing. They spit in Jesus' face and buffeted him. Buff, you know, in the Caribbean we say cough, <laughs> right? They, they, they buffeted him and others smote him with the palms of their hands. I have to let you know, right? That is only a converted person, right? It's only when a person is converted. Jesus, Jesus was not converted, as it were, because he never sinned. But with you and me, it's only a converted person, right, will be able to stomach this and not react. <laughs> what? what, what? <laughs> if, you know, for, for a person to spit in your face, I mean, you know, right? <clears throat> and they mocked him, saying, prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? <clears throat> right? Verse 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, You also was with Jesus of Galilee. You see, Peter, Peter is now, he is watching this, right? He is watching these guys, the, the, the mob, hitting Jesus, slapping him in the face, and spitting on him. And Peter is like, Why, 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 are, you, why are you allowing these fools to do this to you, right? And if they do this to you, what, what will become of us who are under you? And he, he is boiling on the inside, right? So the maid comes to him and says, say, you look like you were with one of them. You, you, you were with them, right? Verse 70, he denied before them saying, all, say, all saying, I know not what you are saying. Verse 71, when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him. That, that, that is Satan using human instruments to turn up the, the, the fire, right, under Peter several notches and said unto them that were there, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And I have to let you know that she wasn't speaking softly. She was speaking loudly so that every, this, this person was, right, so that she would gain the attention of everyone. 
and it is irritating Peter to the core. Again, he denied with an oath, I do not know Jesus. <laughs> Verse 73. After a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely, all right, that's verse 73 of Matthew chapter 26. I'll wait until it comes up. Matthew chapter 26, verse 73. And after a while came unto him those that stood by and said to Peter, Surely, you are also one of them, because listen to how you are speaking. Your speech betrays you. <clears throat> verse 74. This is the dormant person, right? <laughs> Remember with David, right? Do latent tendencies that we may not know of, that, that bubble up to the surface when the right set of circumstances converge. All the while, we are behaving well. To church members, we are in good and regular standing. They look up to us as role models, and yet... We may have some latent tendencies that we do not know of. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the so-and-so man. Immediately the cock crew. Verse 75. Peter remembered the word of Jesus which said unto him before the cock crew, You shall deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Right? You know why he was crying? Because that's exactly what Jesus told him. Jesus was just... Jesus wasn't telling him to this, he wasn't making this revelation to put him down. You see, a lot of times when sermons are being preached or when we study the word, some people take offense at Jesus for saying what he says. He's not saying that to put us down. He's saying, that he's saying those things to us in Laodicea so that we'll take an introspect look at ourselves and trust his assessment and make the necessary confession and repentance. And so, Peter, to answer your question, <clears throat> he went through his conversion. Here is where he went through his conversion, right? Now, that's before. Now, he is converted now, right? After this experience. And we look at the same Peter. Give me Acts chapter 5. Same person put in a volatile situation a dangerous situation where he is threatened, not only threatened, but he is attacked physically. Same person. Before, he is behaving well. But under certain circumstances, a, a different person emerges. But now he is converted. Let's see what he would do. Acts chapter 5. Reading from verse uh, uh, 27. We are reading from verse 27. All right. All right. When they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, <clears throat> saying, Did not we, that is verse um, 28, did, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in the name of Jesus? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter. Verse 29, then Peter, right? There's a reason why the Bible says, then Peter and the other apostles, in that order, then Peter. And the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. All right? Verse 40 and 41 of the same chapter. All right? Right, Gamaliel, he speaks to them and tells them, right, <clears throat> if this thing, if this movement, this, Christ, this new Christian church, if it is not of God, it will come to naught, it will fall apart. Verse 40, and to him, that's to Gamaliel, they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and they let them go. Verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing. That's a different person. 
beyond the shadow of a doubt. We, we, we are reading straight scripture here. That's a diff, an entirely different person. In one instance, before conversion, he is behaving well. He's trying to do the right thing, right? He's trying to do, the, and he has, because he has been behaving well for so long, he has come to the conclusion that Jesus' assessment of him is incorrect because he has be, been behaving well for all of these years. A volatile situation comes upon him suddenly, and the, the person who he does not know surfaces. It bubbles to the surface, and he finds out in real time that he has seeds of revenge, right? And, uh, you know, he, he wants to attack. He, he attacked. He goes through his conversion experience, right? And now God did not address the behaviors, but he addresses the heart. He gives him a new heart. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Here is the new creature now put in a similar situation, volatile, and people attack him. Let's see what he would do. Verse 41. And they departed from the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. I don't know about you, brethren. That's two different <laughs> That's two different persons. All right? Emerging there. Before and after. And that's why the Bible study was titled Good Behavior Versus Conversion. A person could behave well. <laughs> a person could behave well. You know, a person could behave well. <laughs> I try to behave well. <laughs> I, I, I try by the grace of God to behave well. But, you know, God is saying to me and to you, don't be satisfied. Don't, don't stop at good behavior. You have to reach for, for the ultimate, for conversion. And that takes place when we read the word of God, when we listen to sermons coming from God-ordained, you know, ministers. And, you know, they, they point out sin in our lives or they, they point out tendencies, latent tendencies. We don't brush it off and say, hey, I know somebody that you know, you're speaking about. It's you. It's me. Right? We take it personally. We go to the Lord in prayer. And we ask him to convert us. And he will. And when it takes place, a different, an entirely different person emerges. You could shake a converted person inside up, upside down. You could rough them up. You could spit on them. You could call them a slave. You understand? <laughs> you call some people a slave in, 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 in our day and age where, you know, uh, people are so sensitive. You call a black man a slave in our day, you know? Born by Jesse Jackson. <laughs> the complaint. <laughs> yeah, you, you understand? I take it personally. You understand? My rights. You understand? My rights. The self-defense. You know, I, I'll take things into my own. Yeah. But a converted person, you could shake them inside out, upside down. Right? Sideways. You know, you could spit on. Right? If they are converted, a different person emerges. Uh, you read the Bible from cover to cover from that point that we read in Matthew chapter 26. Peter never, ever manifested the disposition that was manifested in the garden, not once. <laughs> That's because he was a different person. He wasn't just a well-behaved person. You have a lot of well-behaved persons, you know? Yeah, a well-behaved person. Until somebody mashes your corn. <laughs> And Satan knows how to mash a corn. You better believe it. He knows how to mash a corn. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Wouldn't you say that um, most of the conversion came or was solid solidified on the day of Pentecost? Oh, oh, oh. Because <laughs> the Holy Spirit was there with them so that they could withstand anything that came after that. All right, that's a very good question that they asked. Their conversion came before the day of Pentecost, right? You see, on the day of Pentecost, if you read it, right, in, in Acts chapter 2, right? 
they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, right? That's what it said in Acts, right? And what happened is that they were given increments of the Holy Ghost before to bring them to that point where God could load them. You see, God cannot load us fully with the Holy Spirit if we have dormant and latent tendencies that have not been addressed. He cannot. You know why? It will be dangerous to do so. And so, could I give you this scripture? So, so that we have... Um, so that we'll just verify what is being said, right? Hold on. Um, let me see if I could um, find it. Here. Hold on one second. Um, okay. Just bear with me. Just bear with me. All right. John chapter 20. Read them from verse 19. John chapter 20, read them from verse 19. For context, answer your question. <clears throat> we'll ask our operator to put it up on the screen and then we'll take that online question. We, we haven't forgotten. All right? Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, that's when Jesus Christ had come from the grave, right? Resurrection day. The doors being shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Um, uh, should we say this? Yeah, should we say this? All right. Let, let, let's back up. Verse 19. We should say something. You asked a question concerning when were they converted. Um, <clears throat> the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. <clears throat> there are times when fear can play a role in a person's conversion. You see, <clears throat> I look at a lot of nature videos, documentaries on nature, and you will discover that wherever and whenever there's a wildfire, the animals stop fighting. <laughs> ha haven't you ever noticed that? You know, the, the lions and the lambs, they lie down together or they run together, but nobody's starting to eat one another because they are facing a common threat. You understand? And so they behave themselves well because the fire will take out good and bad and in between, right? And so now, for fear of the Jews, they are stuck in the upper room. They are scared stiff. Sadly, there, there are instances when fear plays a role in a person's conversion. The men of Nineveh shall rise in, this, in the judgment and condemn this generation because they repented, right? In that instance with the Ninevites, fear played a role because Jonah came and he said, 40 days. He, he didn't tell them what to do. He said, yeah, 40 days. <laughs> he gave them an ultimatum. You have 40 days. And you know what happened? It, you know, it, it shouldn't be that way. You know, God doesn't want it to be that way. But the fact of the matter is that there are times when fear could play a role in a person's conversion. Let's read, right? Um, so Jesus came and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you, right? You see that? Right? right? When he had so said, we are going down to verse 22, right? So we're reading 20 to 22. When he had so said, he showed unto them his hands, his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them, unto them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father had sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This is before Acts chapter 2. 
And so they were given increments of the Holy Ghost leading up to Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when they were fully loaded because if God were to load us fully with the Holy Ghost, it will be dangerous if we have latent, dormant, evil tendencies still retained in our character. All right? So, um, yeah. Uh, and Jesus is pleading with us in Revelation chapter 3. Let's take an online question. We had an online question there. Let's, but um, he is pleading with us in Revelation chapter 3, and he hopes, it is his desire that we take his assessment personally, repent, and ask him to do that which we cannot do for ourselves. Give us a new heart, a new heart and mind, so that we will reflect his character. All right. Can a converted person be coarse in correcting others? All right. That should know better. Example, flipping the table like rice. Okay. All right. Let me answer the first part of the question. This is a good question. Can a converted person be coarse in correcting others that should know better? There are times when a person may have to, a converted person may have to be coarse. <clears throat> All right? Now, the Bible teaches us, right, of sound speech that cannot be condemned. We are not talking about using foul language, right? But listen to Paul to Timothy. Rebuke sharply. That's in the New Testament, right? Speaking of those, you know, who would need a sharp rebuke, right? You see, there, there, there are times, after letting you know, brethren, there, there are times in our experience, uh, Christian, you, you give your life to Christ, where he pleads with you. Pleads with you, pleads with you. Hey, John, Jane, whoever. Hey, you know, hey. You need conversion. You need conversion. You're pleading, pleading, pleading. But sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> and now he has to speak now, right? In the language, right? He, he has to speak in a rougher language, <laughs> right? Like he did with the children of Israel on Mount Carmel. How long hold he between opinions? If God be God's servant, if not, if Baal be God's servant, they answer them not a word. There are times when a converted person would have to be coarse. And when we say coarse, you might have to be very direct. A person might be called to be very direct. Right? We are not talking about disrespectful. Right? That's, disrespectful is different. But coarse meaning direct. I hope that is what the, the questioner means. Right? And John the Baptist. <clears throat> he was very direct with Herod. When he went by Herod, Herod came to him. He said, Herod, right? You are sleeping with your brother's wife and that is wrong. Straight up. He was beheaded later, but he did speak the truth. There, there, there are times when a person would have to be, right, or persons and nations might have to be rebuked sharply. What? Nebuchadnezzar. God spoke to him through Daniel, the prophet. said, do this. Repent of his sins. All right? Let me read it for you. Give me Daniel. All right? Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel, um, right, Daniel. Um, King, ne King Nebuchadnezzar was exalting himself. Is not this great Babylon that I have built by mine own power, by the excellency of my power? And God is telling him over and over again, right? That's a wrong course of action. 
You need to make, you need to change. I need to change you. He wouldn't hear. And then he gets a dream. He sees a tree in his dream, a huge tree, where all the animals and birds of the air, they find rest and they find food. And then a holy one from heaven comes down and says, cut it down. The Lord changes his tone. Because, right, when he is pleading with Nebuchadnezzar through the prophet Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar ain't listening, or like Peter, right? He is taking Daniel's assessment as being incorrect. Verse 17, Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. Reading from this verse 17, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will and sets up over it the basis, um, the basis of men. And then you read, you read, you read down there. Right? Um, verse 26, after Daniel is explaining to him the dream that he had, we won't read the whole thing, you know, you could read it in Daniel chapter 4. Right? Daniel chapter 4, and we are reading... Um, from verse 26, and whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree roots, your kingdom shall be sure unto you after that you have known that the heavens do rule. Verse 27, this is God pleading, right? He's not, he's not speaking to him coarsely. Wherefore, o king, let my counsel be acceptable unto you and break off your sins by righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the, to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. All right? You read the rest of the chapter. There was no change in Nebuchadnezzar. He never took the assessment given by God through the prophet Daniel. He never took it personally and he continued his self-exaltation and pride. All right? Let's go down to verse 29. Verse 29. At the end of 12 months, Nebuchadnezzar is walking in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon, and he speaks to himself and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth. Verse 31, right? Now, God is going to speak to him now by judgments. It's a course of form, right? Not necessary, right? Should not be necessary, but in this case, the king would not hear. All right? While the word was in his mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from you, and they shall drive you right, from men. Verse 32, And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you to eat grass as oxen and seven years times, right? Seven years shall pass over you until you understand that the Most High rules in the kingdom of heaven and gives it to whomsoever he will. Verse 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men. He ate grass as oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Verse 34, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Verse 37 of the same chapter. Verse 37. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol the 
and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. That's a change. That's a converted person, right? He has a change of heart, but God had to speak to him coarsely. So although it is not desirable, and it ain't cute by any means, yet the Bible teaches us that in some instances, God has to use a direct means, you know? The, the question I use the word course, I prefer the word direct, but it means the same thing, to reach those whom he is trying to save. All right, let, let's take our next online question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you believe that Peter took action to prove that he was correct and that Jesus was wrong? No, I, I don't believe that. I, 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 don't, I don't believe that he was trying to prove a point. He was genu genuinely offended. You, you see, what we do as human beings, right? What you and I do naturally as human beings, if somebody would attack us, is a fight. That's what Jacob did before he was converted, <laughs> right? When he felt the, 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 the man's hand on he fought. That, that, that's what we do. <laughs> right? <laughs> you fight. Right? People in Ukraine, they, they, they are threatened by Russia. They fight. <laughs> right? That's what we naturally do. All right? And so when Jacob felt that, that, that hand laid on him, you know, by the brook Jabbok or the river Jabbok or whatever it is, the natural response in us. We, we, the, the, these are the latent tendencies that we are speaking about. You know, you, you know, you have often heard me say, um, say, right, on Bible study, right? If I were to get up in the morning, right, early one morning, <laughs> and, I, I, were to see, and I, were to, I were to see a shadow walking around in my backyard, right? I'll go back in my room, open my top drawer, and pull out my Bible. <laughs> Well, <laughs> and go after the shadow, right, you know. Now, I have to let you know, that is what I would like to do. <laughs> is that the right thing to do? I, I could show you several passages in the Bible to confirm that that's the right thing to do. I'm not sure that I will do that. <laughs> I, that, that that's the only problem. I, I'm not sure that I will do that. I, I would like to do it, you know. I believe, you know, but... I'm not 100% sure that is my Bible that I will be pulling out of my top drawer. I don't know. It might be a tennis racket. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, 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 you understand what I'm saying? So, <clears throat> you know, we, we read all these good things. We know what is the right thing to do. What is the Christ-like thing to do? But if our backs are put against a wall suddenly and Satan turns up the notches seven times hotter, as it were, would we do the right thing? You would only do the right thing in a volatile circumstance if you are converted. <laughs> That's what the Lord is saying to us. You, you have, you have to, we have to be converted in order let me put it this way. You know, we're speaking as friends, right? What, what often takes place <laughs> is that <laughs> if a, a volatile situation comes upon us suddenly, right, the first set of thoughts that rush to our mind are like Peter's, right? They, they, may, they may not find fruition in, in, in actions, but, but the first set of thoughts that come to our mind Vengeance, revenge, payback, you know, justice. And then sometimes afterwards when we cool down, we said, you know what? This is the right thing to do. With a converted person, <laughs> the first set of thoughts that rush to your mind, <laughs> right, are the right things to do. The, uh, not, not, not the first set. The, the only set. <laughs> <laughs> because that's who you are. Yeah, 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 that's who you are. All right? And so, God is saying to us now, be careful 
with good behavior. Because we might be, we might have been behaving well for all these years, but we just might not never have been converted as in a change, an entire change of heart where the devil could send a curveball our way through human agents and we respond in a Christ-like manner. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, you know I, I know exactly what I'm saying. You know, um, yeah, it's you know, it, I think it it calls for humility to accept that teaching. You know, because if we have a track record of behaving well, it's it's kind of tough for somebody to come and say that you know we might have latent tendencies that we do not know of. It, it's kind of tough to swallow that. You know, yeah, sure, sure. Uh -huh. What would you suggest <laughs> that we do to have a proper conversion? And if we do with a proper conversion, how would we know? Is there any... Oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you will know. <laughs> For, watch. For sure you're going to know. I have to, answer, <laughs> I have to answer the last part of your question. For sure you're going to know. But the first part of your question is very important. What do we do now? Right? Okay. Right? Yeah, we pray. But we have to confess to God that his assessment of us in Revelation chapter 3 is correct. Even though for maybe for many years we might not have had a, a blow up, as it were, <laughs> like, like, like Peter. So we accept his assessment by faith and we say, Lord, in my situation, in your situation, search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me that I do not know of, latent tendencies, and then lead me in the paths of righteousness. That's what we do. That, 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 that's the response that he is looking for. He, he, he is not looking for the response where, you know, after reading Revelation chapter 3, you know, I know somebody like that. No, 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 no. It's you and me personally he's speaking to. He's speaking to the church as a corporate body, but to you and I individually, because his assessment is that there are many well-behaved individuals residing in Laodicea. All right? Let's take an online comment and then we'll take anything here locally. <coughs> Good behavior without conversion is legalism. Well, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I will go so far as to say it's legalism because people are really trying to do the right thing. Right? Uh, so, you know, it, 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 might, it might not be, it might, legalism is where, uh, well, it, 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 it really is. <laughs> in, in a sense, it really is, you know, because um, legalism is, 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 um, is when a person depends upon their good works for salvation, right? So it might be slightly different, but yes, there are, there are undertones of legalism in good behavior with conversion. That is true, right? Yeah. Because, um, Peter did not accept Christ's assessment of him based upon his track record. Right? So, yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sure. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to also make a comment because I think you have done a Bible study similar to this one before. Uh huh. Uh -huh. A, a couple months now. Uh huh. And then after you did that Bible study, one day I was driving uh -huh. in a, in a, um, it, we call a strip mall, where so you have the people coming out of the parking yeah, lots yes, and coming, yeah. but I'm driving on the straight, mm -hmm. and this guy was coming out of the parking area, and he didn't stop, and I was coming, but I saw the car coming, uh -huh. but he just came right out on me, and I had to actually swerve my car for him not to hit me in the side. Yes. And Brother Mac, I don't want to tell you what came out of my mouth. <laughs> and your Bible study came back. My heart was beating so hard because I really thought he had hit me. Uh -huh. And the minute the words came out of my mouth, I said to myself, Janice, you're not converted. <laughs> I, I, that was what came out because I was so shocked at myself. But, but I was so frightened because my heart was just beating yeah, so hard. It was palpitating, yeah. Right, because I was like, oh my goodness, I was almost hit by this guy. Wow. 
and yeah. and the Bible study came right back to me when 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 the words came out of my mouth, and I said, "Oh, Janice, you're not converted. God forgive me," <laughs> yeah. because I was like just yeah. so. So I understand what you're saying. Sometimes you don't even realize yeah. Yeah. that you have these latent yeah, yeah. things in you, yeah, because you're living. The, the 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 good good the good and y yeah yeah so well, you well behaved right the well behaved life that yeah. you you would think that not that's not you uh -huh. but yeah. sometimes it is you and you really have to yeah. pray you you know but I, you know I have to say to you that um judging from what I can see in you now I believe that if a situation like that were to happen to you again you know it would yes, be a it would be a psalm it would be a psalm that would come out of <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope so. That, that, you see, that, that, that's it. And, and, and he asks a question. How would you know? The Lord will allow experiences to come our way. You are absolutely going to know. <laughs> you, you, you absolutely, once you are praying and you ask God, like David, search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me, you're going to know. Peter knew. <laughs> After they beat Peter, they, this is a physical attack. Yeah. Right? He, he went on his way rejoicing. That is a completely different person being manifest. Absolutely. So I, I think that, 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 that that's what the message is for this afternoon, right? Let us not become complacent with, with good behavior and say, we have reached. No, God is speaking to you and I personally, as a corporate body, but to us individually. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, go ahead, uh, my brother. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Brother Mark. Yes, good afternoon. Uh -huh. uh, I just have a question to ask you. Mm -hmm. um, in today's um, sermon, mm -hmm. Brother Sukai say, if you are going through life and you're supposed to be a Christian and you have no, let's just simply say you have no problem, mm -hmm. and then the devil is pleased with how you're living because you're doing something wrong and not aware of it. Uh, all right, okay. <laughs> is you think maybe God put an edge around some of us that we don't have to go through any trial and crosses? Uh, well, it, it, it doesn't happen like that. The, um, the Bible says, all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, um, <clears throat> straight is the way, right? And now is the gate that leadeth unto life eternal, and few there be that find it. And so, <clears throat> in, in real life, in real life, God gives to us periods of peace, right? He, he gives us periods of peace, like with Job, or periods of prosperity, when everything is going smooth, you have everything on the wraps, right? Um, and then there are times, like it's stated in Corinthians, he will not allow us to be tempted above that we are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that we may be able to bear it. So there are times when the tables could turn in our lives and we have problems, we have issues. But <clears throat> just let me make a comment on, 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 that, on that concept. Let none be deceived. You believe in Jesus, you're going to have problems. You don't believe in him, you'll still have problems. <laughs> Watch. You'll always have some sort, some sort of problem. Now, with a Christian, right, we go through periods, right? You go through a period of peace and whatever it is. And then, you know, sometimes, you know, we would have to be tempted, in, you know, for character development. But as a general rule of thumb, if you are living on this planet, you are going to have some sort of problems. The difference with Jesus is that you have backup. <laughs> is it, you have somebody to turn to. Woe betide you if you don't have anybody to turn to. You know? And so, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think what was said, you know, we, we, just, we have to give allowance, you know, for, you know, people say things in, you know, different ways. But um, you're going to have problems. Job, 
He was doing good, right? The angels of God were, you know, were protecting him. <clears throat> yeah, you know, it was tough. It was tough for me. It was tough for me living in this country, right? I lived under the shadow of the Almighty in the USA for many years. I mean, only under the shadow of the Almighty for many years. I mean, I mean you, you guys probably don't know that. The online listeners probably don't know that. I used to come to Bible study, and I had to be watching in the rearview mirror. I'll explain what I mean by that. I lived in this country under the shadow of the Almighty for many, many years. And then, after a while, God lifts it. <laughs> Let me show you something. <clears throat> after David was anointed by Samuel, his problem started. <laughs> what? what? David was going good, you know, I mean, you know, he was um, keeping his father's sheep and everything was going, you know, nice and smooth <laughs> until he was anointed to be king. After he was anointed by, um, by Samuel and he killed Goliath, right? Remember? The tables turned for David. He was hunted like a wild beast. You know, he, he, he pleaded with Saul. He said, what sin have I done? Why you have me as the most wanted person on the planet? And it was during those times that David had his closest walk with God. You see? Because a lot of times when we are in the valley, that's, that, that, that's when we learn to walk by faith and trust God. And he's able to reveal himself. That's what, you know, um, God said to Paul. My, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so when David found himself having to run, on the run, living in the desert, in, you know, in En Gedi, you know, with the wild goats, you know, he, he, he wrote some of, some of his most sublime psalms during those dark hours of his life. They're not really dark hours. They are really bright spots. But we often look at them as dark hours in his experience. And so, the time came when God lifted the cloud. <laughs> right? He lifted the cloud. Joseph. <laughs> As a Christian, Joseph, <laughs> he went through some rough things. He, he, he got jailed after doing the right thing. <laughs> Joseph was put in jail for doing the right thing. Right? And so I, I think that is what Elder Sukai was referring to this morning, right? As a Christian, you're going to have some issues, right? You're going to have some problems, right? The difference is whether you have backup. <laughs> you, you, you must have backup. The backup is in Jesus Christ. He's the only backup. <laughs> you have to have backup. And so, yes, it, 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 it goes like, it, it goes, I, I will say, in periods, periodically. You, you go through period, a dark, you're down in the valley, you have to fight with wild beasts, as Paul said, you know, at Ephesus, you know, you go through your room, and then sometimes the cloud is lifted, and then you get a breather, and then, you know what happened is that, could we speak? <laughs> there are times when we are more in danger when we get a breather, than when we are in the valley. <laughs> you, you, you know? When we, are in, when we are in the valley, and we have no choice but to trust in God, you know? We, we are humble. We behave ourselves well. <laughs> when David was in the wilderness of En Gedi, he, has to, he, he can't sleep properly at night because Saul is on his tracks. Humble, praying, trusting in God. And, you know, at what time I am afraid I will trust in these, right in these psalms. When the, when the cloud is lifted and God puts him on a pinnacle, Bathsheba. <laughs> but in the wilderness of Engedi, he ain't have time to think about Bathsheba. 
he had to take over Saul <laughs> because he's on the track. And so it, it goes through periods. We, we go through periods, pre periods of prosperity, peace, whatever, you know, easy going. But then there are times when God has to bring us like down to earth, give us a reality check as it, as it were. All right? Um, let, let's take an online comment. A lot of people avoid trials like the rain <laughs> so that they don't get wet. But when the time of trouble comes, many people will change colors really quickly. That is true. The time of trouble spoken of in Daniel chapter 12, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. Then you will see who is who. <laughs> well, let, let me say this. We should not wait until that time to find out who is who. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as our personal walk with God is concerned. You know? Um, it's one thing to, to say that we believe in God, there's a hymn that we, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. That, that, that's one level, right? Sit down here in a nice air conditioned thing, you know? Air conditioned place, you know? We have music and song system, and when we go home, you know, we drive your pretty car, you go home to your house, you have a lot of money, sit down in the bank. It's easy to say, it's, it's, it's so sweet to trust in Jesus. But let the table turn, <laughs> right? Let the carpet be pulled out from under our feet. And we have to walk by faith alone. A different person might emerge. Maybe. Now is the time. We take Jesus' assessment of us in Revelation personally, and we ask like David, search me and try me, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and then lead me in the ways everlasting. Yeah. All right, yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Can you see here and not know? That's a nice question. I like that question, man. <laughs> you listen to that question? Can you be converted and not know it? You know what happened? Is that a converted person? Let me give you a passage to answer. I'll ask you. Can you be converted and not know it? Uh, all right, okay. That's. That's one of the things about a converted person. <laughs> they generally don't check on their conversion. <laughs> what? Um, give me Matthew chapter 25. You see, it has, when conversion has taken place in a person, it becomes second nature. So, you know, worry, you know, check it. what? Matthew chapter 25. Reading from verse um, reading from verse 31. We'll read from verse 31 to 40. To answer your question, right? When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a sheep divided his as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And uh, verse 33, he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say, verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry. Verse 35. You gave me food. I was thirsty. You gave me drink. I was a stranger. You took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Listen to the righteous now. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Apparently they didn't know. <laughs> you, 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 you know? So they were not conscious of their well-doing. 
because it was second nature to them. They answer, when, when did we see you hungry? You can't remember. <laughs> or thirsty, and we gave you a drink. When, when, did you see, when did we see you a stranger? We, we can't remember. Right? So, they, in one sense, they would know, but in a, on, on a deeper level, they are not, it is not something that they would be conscious of to say, all right, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'm a convert. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, and you, you could read the rest here, you know? When saw we did a strange aunt of me? Um, when, when did we see you sick? You see, there, there, there's a difference, right? With, with, with the secular version of being well-behaved, doing good, right? Um, you know, there, there, there's a program that comes every year and on CNN, CNN Heroes, right? CNN Heroes and, you know, Anderson Cooper, whoever, they go looking for people who have done good and they've... But <laughs> with a truly converted person, from what we have just read, they seem not to be aware of doing good. <laughs> they, they do it because that's who they have become by the grace of God. And so they do not sound that trumpet before them, right, concerning what good they have done. And Jesus told them, call me blessed of my father. They're, they're trying to remember, when, when did we see you hungry and feed you? <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difference. It's a difference, you know? Okay, let's take an online question. Number three. Does Peter represent those who fold when it comes to pressure? I think Peter represents a good portion of us. <laughs> you know? There, there, there are different types of pressure that the enemy brings against our souls. Right? It's not only like violence or a physical abuse or whatever it is. He, he brings pressure to bear against our souls in the areas that he has tempted us previously before. Right? And he knows which areas, you know. He might bring a different kind of pressure against me than he might bring, bring against you. If, if you are a person, or if, if someone is, um, has, a, has a temper problem, he's going to bring temptations on, on, on temper. <laughs> right, that, 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 will, that will tempt you to manifest anger. He'll trip you up. <laughs> right? So, you know, um, a person who is, has another form of weakness, right, or latent tendency, he'll bring another temptation S suited to that person. He tailor makes his temptation. And so, yes, the, the pressure might um, be different depending on the person, right? Um, some people might be willing to go to death, uh, to be a martyr for Christ's kingdom, but they might be weak in another area. <laughs> and so the pressure takes various forms depending on the person in question. But Peter represents those who fold when it comes to pressure. And the reason why Peter folded is because he was behaving well without conversion. <laughs> I, 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 we, we cannot stress that enough. It, you know, things were going good. According to you know, his liking or whatever, is nice and smooth, he behaved well. But when it came to personal, <laughs> you, you see, the, the, the enemy tempts us on a personal level. <clears throat> after, after his conversion, and he receives the Holy Ghost and whatever it is, and the, the new man, Peter never ever responds. You see, I like that question that you ask, because when, when you're converted, you don't have to think about responding. <laughs> you see, as it is right now, sometimes we have to think about how we will respond. When a person is truly converted, you don't have to think about how you will respond, because as we stated in Bible study, they could shake you inside out, upside down. There's only one response coming out, a Christ-like response. <laughs> and so Peter, after they beat Peter, right, and the other disciples, he didn't have to sit down and think about it, you know. 
All right. And make a conscious decision. Um, all right, so yeah. I'll do the right thing in this situation. He didn't have to do that. <laughs> because conversion, <laughs> that is what conversion does. It, it changes us materially, right? The inner man is a new heart and a new mind. We, we cannot stress that enough. Let's take a next question online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> After Peter was converted, do you believe that he was still holding on to his prejudice towards the Gentiles? because of his personal experiences and was still learning how to be a new creation. He was a new creation, and that is why he could learn. After a person is converted, that does not prevent them from growing further. You still have to learn at the feet of Jesus Christ. But watch, as, watch at his attitude when Jesus spoke to him concerning the Gentiles. Look at his response. His response is the response of a converted person. When, when Jesus revealed to him, right, with Cornelius. Mm. Yeah. Let me read it for you. We, we, like, the, we like the Bible to, to speak for itself, right? Um, give me Acts chapter mm, 10, I think it is. Acts chapter 10. All right? Acts chapter 10. <coughs> All right? Read them from verse 1, right? We'll go from verses 1. We'll go from verses 1 to 6. And then um, we'll go from verses 9. To 17. We like the Bible to speak for itself. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. A devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming in unto him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers, thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, verse 5, right? And call for one Simon. That's Peter, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside, and he will tell you what you ought to do. <clears throat> verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the house of the prey about the sixth hour. He became very hungry, verse 10, and would have eaten. But while they made ready, whilst they were preparing lunch or whatever, he fell into a trance. He sees heaven opened, right? And a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts and creeping things and falls of the air. There came a voice unto him, verse 13, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter responds, verse 14, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The voice spoke unto him the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call thou not common. This was done three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Verse 17, Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision meant, Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. <clears throat> right? And so, this here has nothing to do with food. Right? The um, Cornelius, right? He was a centurion of the band called the Italian band. He was not a Jew. I'm answering the, the question posed, right, by the question, right? Right? He was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. And so Peter is now converted, but he, he still has room to grow in his understanding of the things of God's kingdom. We do not reach a point where there is no room for us to grow. Even in heaven, we will continue to grow in knowledge and in understanding. All right? Verse, let's go down to hmm, verse 25 of the same chapter. And then... 
we'll go to verse 29. Verse 25. As Peter was coming in, right, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Right? That's one of the signs of a truly converted person. They do not take worship. Right? They do not, they do not take or crave worship and praise as some men and some presidents do. That was a dark sentence. Right? Acts chapter 10, verse 27. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many. These, these are Gentiles that will come together. Verse 28. He says unto them, You know how that it is unlawful for a man who is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came unto you without gain, saying, as soon as I was sent for, I ask you, therefore, for what intent you have sent for me. That's the response of a converted man. <clears throat> Whereas, previously, he had his biases, right? He had his biases. Now God is correcting him. He is correcting his, his perspective on the human family. And God is showing that God is showing Peter that Jesus Christ died for everyone. What is his response? The response is from a converted person, right? God had showed me, he has taught me not to call any man common or unclean. That response comes from a converted person. An unconverted person will contest that. <laughs> An unconverted person will contest that. They'll say, hey, you know, this is what is written. No. Peter was converted. So even though he was converted, yet he still had room to grow. Paul had room to grow. You read the book of Acts. Paul had room to grow. He grew. All the disciples, they had room to grow. Being converted does not bring an end to our growth in grace and spiritual things and understanding and knowledge. No. We will continue to grow. Always. The Bible says that. We shall grow up in Isaiah. We shall grow up as calves of the soul, we'll continue to grow in understanding, in our knowledge of God, right? It continues, it continues after conversion, nonstop. Right? All right, are there any other questions or concerns? If not, we'll ask Lindry to close first with prayer. Have a good week, everyone. Consider what was said, you know? T take it personally then. C consider what was said. Um, good behavior versus conversion. Good behavior is based upon is situational. You know? Conversion has to do with the entire man, with the entire woman. They shake you inside out, upside down. Me, my, you know, whoever. It's only righteousness will come out because of conversion. A change of heart has taken place. So let's pray and ask God for it. We'll ask Lindsay to close for us in prayer. Have a good week, everyone. Loving Lord, as we um, come to a close today, we want to give you praise and thanks for all the things that we have learned um, throughout your Sabbath today. And Lord, as I pray these words, I ask you to um, cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind, so that the words that are uttered would be able to be heard on high. And, Lord, that you would be able to come and abide with each one of us. And so we give you praise and thanks, Lord, for all that you do and all that you are. And we ask, Lord, your continued presence in our lives as um, we go through a new week. Um, we pray, Lord, that um, you would help us to um, be truly converted and um, be able to be a vessel for you to um, work with you to be able to work with others in such a way that um, the message lord of your soon coming would be spread um, far and wide and um, new disciples would be made for you so lord today um, we give you our hearts and minds and we ask you to come in 
Yes. Bless each one that um, has been here that's listening. Bless those that come um, behind us to watch and to listen for the um, nuggets of truth. And I pray, Lord, that you would enlighten each heart and mind as they continue to search. Um, just keep us with your grace. Um, be with us as we depart, whether it's um, from here or um, online. I just pray, Lord, that your spirit would go with us and carry us through the week, Lord. And if it's your will, that um, we each would be able to return here once again to give you praise and thanks, Lord, for all that you've done throughout the week because we know many started but did not finish. And so we thank you, Lord, for watching over us, for keeping us. And we ask and pray all these things, Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And we say, amen. Amen, amen. Well, have a good week, everyone. God bless you and your families. Stay safe. All right?